All right, next up we've got Inglorious Bastards because every big director has to make their war movie and Quentin Tarantino uh, had to go for World War II, which is kind of the obvious pick. Most, most directors go World War II. Um, it's just the most popular war to make a movie about. Uh, now, I like war movies. I... I know a lot of people feel like they're the same thing over and over and again, but I feel that to be true with any genre of anything. Like, if you're not a fan of heavy metal music, you think all heavy metal music sounds exactly the same, but if you're a fan of it, then you hear all the subtleties, you hear all the differences, and it, they're not the same. If you're, a, you know, if you really don't like rap music, if you really don't like horror movies, if you really don't like period piece dramas, if you don't really like whatever, it all seems the same to you. But if you're a fan, you see the differences, as I had said. Um, so yeah, I mean, like any genre of film, because I'm pretty much open to anything. If it's good, I'll like it. If it isn't, I won't. You know, that's that. I mean, it's pretty simple. There's no real genres that I'm opposed to. And so when I heard Tarantino was making a war movie, I got very excited because I knew he was going to make it different than anything I'd ever seen before, in, in, especially in World War II. And my God, was I right. Of course, I was there opening night and I was having a blast. Now, when I say a blast, I want to, I want to try to say, though, that this movie is pretty slow. It's almost three hours long, like a lot of Tarantino's films, and probably 80 to 90 percent of the movie is in another language other than English. It's either German or uh, French, and that is pretty wild. I mean, for Tarantino to take on a movie like this must have been hard to direct for a guy that can't speak the language. As far as I'm aware, I, I don't know him being able to speak German or French. But uh, I always think that it must be very difficult to direct people when you don't know what words they're actually saying. You can see performance, and, and, and that's all good and well, but you don't really know if they're saying the wrong, line's wrong, and you're going to have to have someone there that's like, oh, um, by the way, uh, to mess that little line up there, and he's not going to be able to know in the moment. So that's difficult. And another really, really difficult thing, and one of the you know biggest strengths of this movie, because I think this is an outright masterpiece. I think this movie is flawless, and holy shit, man, I absolutely adore this movie. But one of the one of the big challenges of this movie would be the casting, and I think first and foremost would be Hans Landa, and finding the gem that is Christoph Waltz. I mean. This guy brings such a charisma and he brings, he's such a likable piece of shit. Like this is a character that if you met him in real life, if he actually existed, you would hate his guts. But because of how charismatic and, and uh, charming and hilarious Waltz is in this movie, you can't help but like the guy. You don't like the guy, you know what I'm saying, but you like him. He's that bad guy you can't help but but enjoy. Um, and what a find. What an absolute find this was for the casting department, for Quentin Tarantino, for a guy to be able to deliver the lines that, like he does in German, in French, in English, in Italian, Italian. Uh, un unbelievable. And then you've got Diana Kruger, you've or Diane Kruger, or is it Diana? It's Diane, isn't it? Um, and you've got Michael Fassbender, and you've got the girl who plays Suzanne, Su Susanna, Suzanne. What's her name? Um, oh, oh, Milani, Milani, Milani Laurent as so Sosana, 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 whatever. Uh, but all these people are absolutely incredible. And just to be able to find people that can speak all these different languages and be able to act in them, because, yeah, as I said, like, what, 80, 85% of this movie is in a different language? What a, what a task for Tarantino to take on and how hard this must have been to cast. But I just feel like when I watch movies sometimes, especially with something like Christoph Waltz in this movie, that... 
I there's there's certain characters, certain actors who play certain characters, and you're like, even though this role wasn't written for you, this role was written for you. This is the perfect fit. I legit don't think anyone else could have done this role any better or as good as Waltz does in this film. It's absolutely incredible, and there's a reason that he won an Oscar for this and the next film, Django. He's unreal good in in both of those movies. So, all right, moving on. So, we have got his uh, this opening sequence here, which is one of the better in uh, cinema. I think it is tense. I think it's funny. I think it's shocking and sad. And this film... And, and Tarantino has that ability. He has that ability in a good amount of his films, Django being another one, which I have sitting here waiting to do next. Um, he has that ability to kind of um, play in all genres throughout the film. You've got drama, you've got comedy, you've got horror, you've got romance, you've got, you've got it all. It's like a one-stop shop, man. It's, it's, uh, I don't want to say Walmart because fuck Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds cheap and blah, blah, blah. but a, a one-stop shop kind of place that's not Walmart. Um, a higher-end Walmart, like a Target or maybe, I don't know, Target even sounds insulting to Tarantino, but you know what I'm getting at. Um, a mall, there you go. He's like a high-end mall. You can get everything from his one one-stop place. Uh, another person that's absolutely incredible in this movie and steals every single fucking frame he's in is Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt in this movie, Aldo Rain, what a ridiculous character. And that's what Quentin Tarantino is so good at doing, that no matter how dark his subject matter is, no matter how, you know, rough the... Uh, situations are whether it be the holocaust or slavery even at the most dire of times even in the most horrendous of scenes there is always a flavor there's always a tinge something of levity be it come from you know um characters attributes uh props uh, musical choices something is always making it just a little playful like even though it's extremely realistic subject matter somehow it's almost like slightly whimsical and daydreamy in a way because it doesn't feel exactly real it feels just lighter and almost all of his movies deal with extremely dark extremely dark material but there's always in every sequence I've ever watched in any Tarantino film there's always just a teeny bit of levity going on within the sequence no matter what it's about and I don't know it, it never it, it keeps the movie from ever feeling like a bummer you're talking about you know kind of one of the most agreed upon uh horrendous things that's ever happened in humankind ever since the dawn of man the holocaust world war ii in general i mean how many people died during that fucking awful war but somehow he's able to make it funny at times it's wild it's it's impressive and you know i'm sure it's insulting to some people but i'm not one of those people i, I see it for how it is it's it's impressive um and Oh man, yeah, this opening sequence is just wild. <laughs> it is so tense, but so funny at the same time, and Waltz just eats that sequence up, as does his counterpart, um, but I'm not familiar with that actor, but I think they both play it super well. And when they come up and shoot him up, and then the girl runs for her life, and she goes over and he puts his gun out, and he's aiming at her, and there's so much tension. Is he gonna take the shot, is he not? And then he just like puts it back and he's so lighthearted and it's like you wonderful piece of shit. Like I love you and I want to strangle you to death right now. You, you never know exactly how you feel about the damn guy. Um, and Aldo Rain, his speech here, you know, the hundred scalps and I want my scalps. 
I could definitely see the argument for his character and his performance in this is too hammy and too over the top, but A, I disagree because I love it. But And I, as I said, I can completely understand the argument, but this is a Tarantino film. As I had said, none of his films exist in reality. They're just like, um, oh, what would be a good way to say this? Um, reality adjacent. <laughs> They're like right there. They're close. But it, it's just like one frame outside of reality. And it just has this playful nature to it. Anyway. Uh, love that speech. Uh, Hitler in this is is a re- really good Hitler. I mean, that sounds weird to say, but it is. It's, it's, a, it's a really good... F- but it's, yet again... I never feel like this is Hitler, but I I do. Like when I look at him and I see the performance and all that, it's Hitler, but it's a more silly Hitler. So it's like, right as I said, it's just right there, bordering reality, but playful. Playful, serious reality. It's a conundrum. It's, It's contradiction unto itself, but there you go. Hugo Stiglitz. I remember seeing this in theaters, and when he's killing all those... Uh, Nazi freaking officers and Gestapo's or whatever and he has that he takes his arm and he shoves it down the guy's throat I fucking laughed out loud at that scene those are the sequences that I get the dirty looks in the theater because I see these in you know opening day and there's it's a Tarantino movie he's a very popular director the theater is packed and so I'm sitting there and I go to the movies by myself so I always find like one seat that's left open somewhere and I sit in between two assholes I don't know who they are they might not be assholes they might be great people I don't know but they seem like assholes to me because when I laugh at horrible moments like people getting their heads crushed in like when Donnie Donowitz beats the guy to death with a bat and just banging his head and it's flopping around I was like crying laughing and the people around me were like what the fuck do you find funny about a man being beat to death with a baseball bat and I'm like, tune in next week for The Walking Dead to find out. No, I just, it's funny. I'm sorry, it is. Fucking insane, over-the-top graphic violence like that. It's hilarious to me. Uh, I'm not sorry. I don't always say I'm sorry. I was, it, we're programmed to say sorry when we're not even fucking sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm sorry for saying sorry. That's what I'm sorry for. There you go. Um, the gore in this movie is fucking fantastic. And it's so good to see a director who can get this kind of budget and be able to do gore and want to do gore and to really like pack it on. The gore in Django as well. Oh, it's gorgeous. But, uh, <laughs> which, you know, uh, I will admit sounds kind of weird to call gore gorgeous, but it puts the gore in gorgeous, right? There you go. It is. It's beautiful, and and it's it's so well on display here. And I just I hate when movies shy away from kills. It's like if you're gonna fucking kill someone in a movie, and it's gonna be in a brutal way. Like if you just want to poison somebody, or if you just want to shoot them in the chest with a small caliber handgun or something, then yeah, you can get away without there being gore. But if you're gonna have a sequence where someone's beating someone to death with a baseball bat, if you're gonna put that in your movie then fucking show it or don't put it in your movie. That is the way I feel about it. Either make the fucking movie like a man or a woman, whatever. I've seen some pretty fucking violent, gory-ass movies by women. Punisher Warzone was done by a woman, which blew my mind when I found that out. I was like, holy shit, that was done by a chick? That's amazing. But yeah, be a... Be a... I don't know. Be fucking tough and do it right gonna have a scene where someone beats someone to death with a baseball bat, skins them alive, scalps them, show it, or don't put it in your movie. Don't be a pussy and try to do tough scenes. Don't. All right. (laughs) That's the way I feel about it. A lot of people would disagree with me, but no one who watches my channel, so I get to, you know, preach to the choir. Um, We've also got Daniel Brule in this, who I'm a big fan of from uh, I like him in this a lot but uh, a really really good movie that he was in called oh what the fuck was that movie called I want to call it I said it was Drive but it wasn't because Rush 
there it is, Rush, directed by Ron Howard with Chris Hemsworth. Um, fucking fantastic. Such a great car racing movie. Um, as I said, I'm open to any genre. As long as they're good, that was great. I saw that in theaters. I was really blown away by it. Barul's great in that. He's really good in uh, Captain America, the, uh, the uh, Civil War, and he will be returning for the Bucky and Falcon series, which I'm very excited for because he's going to actually don his real Zemo mask, which is fantastic. All right, anyway, moving on. <laughs> but Brule's great in this. Uh, everybody's great in this. Is there anybody that was in? I know a lot of people talk shit about the Mike Myers performance in this. I think Mike Myers is good in this. He's silly. Like They're like, oh, he's like... He's silly in this movie. He doesn't really feel real. Does anybody? You're really going to tell me that Brad Pitt's character is right, but Mike Myers' character is out of place? Like, if Brad Pitt's in this movie, if Aldo Reigns in this movie, then how is Mike Myers' character doesn't work? I don't get that. That shit's weird to me. People, people make no sense to me all the fucking time. Uh, the Bear Jew. Um... It <laughs> just that whole sequence, man. I laughed so hard the whole time. He's gonna take that bat and he's gonna beat your ass to death with it. And just oh, like when he says no and he's like he's essentially paraphrasing a little here, but he's like, you know, I was hoping you were gonna say that, you know, him beating you to death with a baseball bat is as close as we get to going to the movies. Like that's just that is just like that is quintessential Tarantino right there. That is Tarantino at his very best. Is when he's writing lines like that. It's just it's stuff you never hear in movies that you always want to hear. Oh, I love it. Uh, of course we got Sam Jackson narrating certain sequences in this because he can't do a movie without Sam Jackson. Um, and um, oh man, like this poor girl, this Sus Susanna, Susanna character, I just feel horrid for this girl's character. But what Tarantino does so well in this movie and in other movies, but this one and Django in particular, is there's such a catharsis to his films because he takes the most despicable people that have ever lived, certain groups of people, whether those be, you know, um, uh, Hitler and, and the, the Third Reich, you know, the Nazis, or it'd be slavers, or whoever. It's just like, these are the people that you want so badly to just be brutalized. And you get so much of that in this and in, in uh, the next one as well. Just, oh, I love it. Um, we're, we're, not in the, we're not in the prisoner taking business. We're in the Nazi killing business, and let me tell you, brother, boys, business is booming. I every line in this movie from from Aldo is is hilarious, and from uh, Hans Landa as well. They're both like every single line from both of them, absolutely incredible. Um, Daniel Burrell's character in this movie killed two hundred and fifty people with a sniper rifle. You would think at one point they would just take like you know a tank or a um, rocket launcher or something and just shoot it into the tower or cut the tower down or like that doesn't seem that difficult that to just blow the thing up with him inside of it I mean they just keep shooting at him this seems absolutely asinine <laughs> there's no way you would be able to snipe 250 fucking plus people in a snipe in a you know in a bird's nest uh and get away with it without a you know an artillery strike of some sort ridiculous but yeah what is what it is uh then she sees hans when when she goes and because this guy is she has a german soldier fawning after her and takes her to hans Landa, which she hasn't seen him since he killed her family and she has to sit at lunch with him and have a strudel with him and all this stuff and he's trying to be charming and funny and she's sitting there and she's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I love the performance from her because as soon as he gets up and walks away she just breaks down it's like she's been holding it in this entire fucking time it's just been killing her and you're like oh my god it's so bad I feel so bad for this girl 
Um, back to the where he beats the guy to death with the bat. It's so funny when the guy just points to the map immediately. You're going to take off that Nazi uniform when you get home? Yeah, we can't abide by that. Oh, he's so good in this goddamn movie. Um, and <clears throat> um, then we got the basement sequence, which I'll tell you a story. So I've played this card game against uh, the head there where you put the name on the head. I don't know what the hell that game is. It's called like headbands and if you buy it in a fucking box. I, I don't know what the hell it's called. But whatever the game's called, where you put the name on the head and you try to guess it. So we were playing this game years ago. My brother, who's probably going to text me here in a second to tell me to get the fuck on Xbox. But uh, he and a bunch of his friends, who are probably around 10 years younger than me, um, this speaks volumes about our education system uh, these days. So let's keep in mind here, people, that every one of these kids graduated high school, got a diploma, and a good amount of them actually went to college, okay? And they were all raised, born and raised, in Arizona, okay? Let's just keep that in mind. So I played this game with them, and they were like, pick a famous person to do, obviously, as you know the game to be. And so I wrote down Billy the Kid, and I put it on a card and I threw it down and someone slapped it on their head and everyone is supposed to look and make sure that they know who that is on there so everyone can agree, yes, I'll know how to say yes and no to the questions that he asked or she asks. And we, everyone was like looking at it and they're like, I don't know who that is. And I was like, what do you mean? And they were like, none of them had ever heard of this person. And they were like, is it an actor? Is it a this and that? I'm like, you don't know who Billy the Kid is? You've never heard that name before. And they were like, nope. And I was like, okay. And I was trying to explain it to him. So I'm like, all right. He's like, you know, he's from the Old West. He's like a Wyatt Earp. And they were like, they were like who's Wyatt Earp? And I was like, you guys were raised in Arizona. You have a fucking diploma. You graduated high school in Arizona. And you don't know who Wyatt Earp is. Okay, if that doesn't tell you anything about our education system here in America, I don't know what else will. But, hey, I was watching fucking uh, Spartacus or Gladiator. I can't remember which movie. Pretty sure it was Spartacus. I was watching that with one of those guys. It was actually a girl, but I was watching that with one of them. And it was a Gladiator match. And uh, one of them got killed. You know, one of the Gladiators. And she was like, oh my god, they killed him. And I was like, yeah, it's gladiator days that's what they do it's fight to the death and she's like what and i'm like yeah like the roman coliseum and she's like what is that like, you don't know what the roman coliseum is she's like no i've never heard of that i'm like <laughs> i'm like gladiator times you've never heard of the roman coliseum and gladiator fights she's like nope and you graduated high school yeah so there you go there you go all right moving on um, but that whole sequence is fucking great. And the whole shootout is so Tarantino. It's so quick and so violent. When Hugo Stiglitz puts his knife into the back of that guy's neck, amazing. And uh, just just thinking back, hearkening back to the, the, the fucking fist down the throat. Just There's so many great kills. And when they come and recruit him and they shoot all those guys and they come in, that's such a great sequence. And there's like the drums and everything. Oh, God, I, f I just want to praise this movie for every single little bit of everything. <sighs> um, but, yeah, you, you better know the, the, uh, the German three versus the American three. That's what gives them away after everything. And the trust. Now, in a lot of movies, I usually get upset when someone breaks someone's trust. If someone trusts somebody and they break that trust, it pisses me off, but... When it comes to a lot of the trust in this movie that gets turned on, I couldn't give a fuck because they're Nazi pieces of shit. So when that guy has Maximilian who's just born and he's like, all right, I'm going to trust you, and she shoots his ass. Now, whether or not Aldo would have shot him, I think they would have, to be honest. But, you know, her shooting him, it makes sense for what he says to her and whatnot. But I, I have to imagine Aldo would have definitely killed him. There's no fucking way. But... Regardless, because there is such a big plan coming right in that moment. And uh, so, yeah, you got that. But then 
with uh, Hans Landa too when he carves it in and he kills this guy and all that. It's like, I get it, but I don't care. Fuck this guy. No way. Um, and I was super bummed that Hugo died in that sequence. Really, really bummed. I was hoping he was going to make it out of this. A lot of them die, though. You got Donnie dies. You've got um, whatever the other guy's name is, Antonio Magretti. He uh, has to die, which is a shame. Um, and we got these long, long, like sweeping shots inside the theater to David Bowie's uh, song there and inside the theater with all the Nazi paraphernalia. I always wonder when I watch these movies of like having to ask for and set dress and all this Nazi shit. Like what you put that stuff in um, storage and it's just like you know you got to go out to Taylor's and be, you know be like I need you to make me giant swastikas and banners and stuff. like it would feel so horrible to be uh, have to make that shit to put it up on the walls. I'd be like ugh, they really have to make this. Please don't make me make this. But, I mean, still stunning. Such stunning shots. Um, oh, when Ter- when, uh, when when Pitt says, when he when you get to here, because he's like, I speak the best out to Italian. And he comes in and she come, comes up and he says hi, and he's like, buongiorno. Like, fucking hilarious. Like, he didn't even try for a second. Um... And the fact that there's two contrasting plans to kill the Nazis and, like, I I feel like either one of them would have worked. Like, did she really need to set the place on fire for that plan to work? And it was pretty shocking that she died as well, that he came up there and he shot her to death too. It's actually a really beautiful sequence of her getting shot and falling back and the blood spray and all of that stuff. But that little fucker, man... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a bummer that she dies. I have to wonder if her dude died. Did he burn the place down? Was she was she expecting to exit? My only problem I have with her plan at all is the two opera boxes were not locked, and Hitler and you know the director and all those guys could have got out of there. So that felt like a little bit of a. Um, it felt it felt like a little bit of a kink in her plan, like just kind of a little bit of a you know a little hole there. But otherwise, it's it's cool. It locked them all in there, went to full carry on them, and, and went to town. But good thing that they were in there with their guns. And and of course, I mean we have to talk about it. Killing Hitler. This is Tarantino. I mean he's not gonna stick to you know history. He's fuck history. I don't care if him and his, you know, Ava Gardner, isn't that what the hell her name was? Whatever his girlfriend's name were supposedly shot themselves or whatever once once they realized they were defeated. Um, fuck all that. Like, it's way better to have him shot. Like, to just watch him take a machine gun. To watch Eli Roth, of all people, the director of Hostel and all those you know, movies, to take a fucking machine gun and just blast into Hitler's face and watch his face just completely disintegrate from, from bullets. Incredible. That's, that's how you want to see Hitler die. You don't want to see him sitting with his girlfriend and taking his own life and his own terms. Hell no. You want to watch a couple freaking Jewish shoulder, soldiers come in and push him down, shoot his ass, and fucking blast into his face as they kill all of his other... Um, associates and uh, you know by uh, end the war <laughs> by and large end the war so it's it's just fantastic and for them to suicide bomb because that's what this is it's a suicide bombing but one I agree with and this was probably around the time it was a little bit before right it was right before the what year did this movie come out when did the Aurora theater shooting happen? I don't know. If that would have happened before this movie, would they have pulled the movie like they did with the Gangster Squad? I don't know. I don't know. But it's an amazing sequence, and this might just be his masterpiece, like he says. Yeah, I mean, it's not my favorite of his, but it's damn near at the top and an excellent film. So anyways, I'm done rambling. i got to get upstairs. Adios.